Yeah. Jack, before we begin, yes. uh, I think I misstated a couple of things the last time we met. I think I stated that uh, I got 95% of the black vote uh, when I ran against Jimmy Fitzmaurice, and I think that was in error. I think it was somewhere in the 87, 88%. I did get 95% uh, of the black vote uh, in the Toledano race. In the general election? Yeah. And I think I only got 40% of the white vote uh, in the Toledano election. Somebody will have to check those figures. My memory is bad enough to, uh, that I can't remember all of those uh, those fractions. And then there were two names I mentioned that were so helpful with the uh, people helpers desk and the uh, the uh, other situation we set up to handle visitors to the city hall mm -hmm. and handle their problems. And that was Margie Stitch and uh, and Norma Freiberg. So I, those are the two things I was reflecting on that I might have misstated. Uh, but Norma and, uh, and Margie really were, were great on, uh, on, on, on those uh, that changed the way City Hall functioned yeah. in terms of people who visited and had problems. They sort of invented customer service for City Hall. Yes, yes. All of it there. before was in the mayor's office under and political appointees who just sat at desk in the mayor's office and handled them as they came in. Were, were and, those uh, Marjorie Stitch and Norma Freiberg volunteers? Uh, initially, yeah. Marjorie was always a volunteer. Norma came initially as a volunteer and then took on a, a paid position, as I recall. Well, I remember them well. The, uh, uh, well. What we can do with, the, with those facts, uh, is make sure that the, uh, our readers uh, and our viewers uh, uh, who are consulting uh, this on, in an archive know that uh, there's a, they'll find a footnote in the <coughs> transcript the first time around saying that there's... Okay, and correction. you know, some of these things, uh, I think the memory on most of this is, uh, is pretty good, though at our age, I'm 83 now, you, you do lose, obviously, with a little senility. <laughs> Uh, I don't think it takes uh, senility. It some, takes... Uh, some memory, but from a factual standpoint, uh, irrespective of a misstatement, I think most of it is pretty accurate. Those who want to be more precise would have to just look, look up the, the uh, exact figures. Which they're capable of doing. And All right. You fine. don't have to get everything right. <laughs> Whatever you got, Jack. So, so um, but as is, is obvious, we are sitting here uh, once again in the, the dining room of uh, Moon and Verna Landrew on uh, South Prior Street. Uh, this is the, uh, our fourth time with, with a camera in this room. The, the uh, first time we talked about the uh, New Orleans urban landscape and how it changed during the 70s and in the Landrieu administration. We talked about the uh, second time about the racial, uh, social context of New Orleans growing up and making a career in politics. Uh, and we talked about that time about the influences that led uh, uh, to a lot of the changes that took place in the 1970s. And then uh, in the third time we uh, uh, had, uh, we allowed that uh, Moon Landrieu had been elected mayor of New Orleans in 1970 and we talked about uh, the administration and uh, what uh, it did uh, on a number of areas, many of them involving race. I thought that this time we might try to um, complete the 1970s outside the mayor's office and then start looking <coughs> back uh, more broadly uh, at uh, what, what was the lasting influence or impact of, of the decade. And uh, uh, we could talk other times, but this, this, this uh, could take a free form or... Uh, well, we whatever, up, Jack. You asked the questions. I do want to make it quite clear throughout this whole process that uh, this is not a reminiscence about no. uh, about me. No. 
that it's about the changes that took place in the decade of the 70s, which Loyola said they wanted to do. Yes. And I've been fairly forthright about looking at the plates that were moving under our feet and the impact that the 50s and 60s had on the 70s. And I think it'd be a good idea to take a look back now that we're uh, 2013 and see what, uh, what lasted and what didn't, what worked about the 70s that impacted the 80s and then the 90s and, and the, next, uh, the next millennium to an extent. And it's pretty fascinating to look back and see those things that worked and who added on to what the city is today and those that uh, have been discarded uh, maybe served a purpose at the time. Not everything lasts forever. Uh, but did it, uh, did it change the direction of the city? Did it add to it? Did it make it a different city? In which ways did it? Yeah. Which ways did it not? Well, clearly, was... clearly the 70s was a crucial point. I don't, I don't question that in many different ways. Because of what happened before and, and now because of what continues thereafter, if it has had an impact. Well, but at, at the end of the 1970s, uh, and, and we are focusing on the 1970s, and we're relying on you as one of the, the key players who was on stage during these um, important changes that were taking place in New Orleans uh, to, um, to help us assess it. But as, as you have advised and we have, uh, have agreed, that there are many other voices that, uh, that are contributing to this. View of the sure, but you can't you can't look at get it from one person. I mean, there are many of us that lived uh, during that period, and we all going to have different views right. of what happened, what didn't happen, and how it happened. But let's take it to the end of the nineteen seventies. All right. You, you uh, there are a couple of ways to to see New Orleans uh, from these two new vantage points you had. One was uh, after you were mayor. Uh, you went to work with uh, the real estate development uh, company of, of Joe Canazero, and then af and shortly after that, you went you accepted an offer to, to become the secretary, secretary of housing of and urban development. What what did New Orleans look like from those two perspectives? Uh, what had what had New Orleans accomplished when you're analyzing it through the lens of a of a real estate developer who sees the opportunity to, uh, to grow with the city? Well, clearly there was a lot of development taking place. Uh, Vic Skiro's administration had widened Poydra Street, uh, and the Dome Stadium was then built, and Poydra Street from Loyola Avenue to Claven was widened further. The first widening of Poydra Street was from Loyola Avenue to the river. And... Uh, that was done during the Skiro years in the 1960s. And it was a tremendous improvement in the city. Now, it created, it, it created a new, a huge new development along this boulevard of Padre Street. At the same time, it had the negative effect of making less important the core area, let's say, of Common Carondelet, uh, of Gravia and St. Charles. That was close to Canal Street and close to the French Quarter. Now, with the widening of Poydras Street, the business development is moving towards Poydras Street. So the high-rises even though there weren't that many new high-rises being built in the old section, the demand for office space and, uh, and for hotels began to shift from that area that was close to Canal Street, now further to, on to Padre Street. And in terms of time, this was picking up in well, the 1970s. Yeah, it, uh, the widening of Padre Street, I forget exactly 
when that was done un under Mascaro, what, what year, but it had to be in the late 60s mm -hmm. that that was done. And of course, we were building the dome, so I know that happened in, in the 1970s. The, uh, as we took the land uh, for the dome stadium, we obviously had to widen Forger Street to accommodate the dome, so that was all being done at the same time. And you can look now from Claven Avenue virtually down to the river and see that it's the site of many, many office buildings that have been built, not only on the dome stadium site, but on Forger Street itself. Uh, as a matter of fact, One Shell Square was being built uh, just at the time uh, we were doing the dome. And uh, when I got out of office, uh, I had the choice of going back to practicing law. I'd met Joe Canizero. He was very energetic and still is a uh, businessman, developer. And uh, Joe invited me to join his firm with him as a partner, and I did. And I worked with Joe for two years, at which time this uh, invitation came from the president to come to Washington and ask me what I serve as Secretary of HUD. Uh, my life has been into politics and into public service and I often look back and wonder whether, <laughs> whether I made a very smart decision. Financially, no, I can tell you that, but, but it was a, a, a life that excited me and I accepted and uh, so I served in Washington for two years and then uh, came back and uh, began something of a, of a minor real estate practice on my own in law practice. Uh, I didn't want to really get back into the building a law firm or anything. And uh, then not too long after that, in 1990, in 1990, uh, after having spent, uh, bought a small building in which my my daughter had an office and uh, my son had an office, uh, along with a partner, we had we were doing little real estate deals, no no big office construction or anything. Uh, then I ran for. Uh, for the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals where I served for the next 10 years and then retired at age 70 into a rather passive life. <laughs> so you say. Uh, let me ask you about, let's go back to HUD. When you got, what did you, t what had New Orleans given uh, that you were taking to Washington in 1979, what was what well, were the I can't say of, I can't say okay. why the president selected me. I suspect uh, because of the activity I had as president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, I had uh, been also the uh, uh, chairman of the Legislative Action Committee that had gone around the country pushing federal legislation on behalf of cities and. Uh, I had uh, gathered the mass together from around the country, major cities, to help save New York. Not that we saved New York, but excuse me, New York was about to go bankrupt. And we made an impression, I think, on on uh, President uh, President Ford, who did not step up to do it, but uh, certainly on the banking interest in New York that. New York's problems were not just New York's problems. They were the problems all cities at that time were having. Uh, these cities were losing momentum and the emphasis was going into the suburbs. And, uh, and it, wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't an easy sell, but New York eventually came out of it. And I guess because of my activities on a national scale as well as as well as looking at uh, New Orleans. Uh, at one time, I'm told, we had more people living in federal housing projects than per capita than any place in America. So we could have also been just the city, I, I don't know. 
and I was always an activist in the Democratic Party. So they uh, somehow asked me and, uh, to do it, and I accepted. Well, while President Carter was still president, and, yes. you, and you were still in that office, what thing, what New Orleans learned practices or policies did you did you take to the national stage? There were no particular policies. I wasn't there that long, and uh, there wasn't uh, an enormous amount of movement uh, on behalf of the federal government. There are huge other problems facing the federal government rather than uh, than just the cities of America. Uh, I was able, because I was Secretary of HUD, to do some things uh, fairly, honestly, for New Orleans that uh, might not have gotten done before. Uh, what are the, I was well. You? I was able to get a twenty million dollar grant to to help build the. Morial Convention Center. I had acquired the land when I was mayor. I had no idea when I acquired that land that it was going to be used for a convention center. Uh, Kabakov at first wanted to build, uh, put a convention center in the uh, uh, in the river where the Riverwalk is today, and I think Mayor Morial didn't support that, but then supported the convention center on the land which we had acquired in our swap out with the Hilton Hotel. Because in order to build the Hilton Hotel, they had to clear the land of city streets and the railroad tracks, and I struck a deal with them that uh, they could get the land free and clear of all city interest from Julia Street uh, to uh, Podger Street, and the city would take the land from Julia Street all the way back to the Mississippi River Bridge. Uh, that's because we had streets running all through it, mm -hmm. and we did not, I did not want to be in business in, in any cooperative way. Today we're doing cooperative things with mm -hmm. big developers. Uh, I was a little concerned about that model. What you mean the thing that everybody now calls the public private partnership? That's correct. I was concerned about that model. I, I'd always thought that the government's function I'm not saying it hasn't worked, but I'm just telling you my philosophy was the government the the purpose of government besides protecting the the citizens and and looking out for their welfare. Uh, was to create an environment in which the private sector could function. It wasn't the government that built it, that built this country. It's not to underestimate the importance of the government in terms of roads and bridges and health care and a multitude of other things. The uh, private sector couldn't function effectively without the government doing its part. Now the question is, what part do you do and what part does the private sector do? I was very much for the private sector function on its own, but within an environment that uh, created by the federal government. And that was keeping the peace, the order, protection, and, uh, and doing those infrastructure things that created an opportunity for the private sector to function. Uh, that was the philosophy, and I think it's a good philosophy. Now, mm -hmm. there are different models that people can use. Uh, so much complaint today about too much government. Uh, government's only important until you need it, you know. <laughs> but there can be a fact of too much regulation, too much this, too much that. Obviously, if you look at the historic districts, they have worked for the city. I don't think there's any question that they have worked for the city. But there are many people just think it's too much rules and regulations on my personal property. It's my property and I should be able to do what I want with it, and that is true within limits. Uh, we've always had zoning laws, at least since the mid-1930s, when we adopted zoning, and and uh, my name is on the last zoning ordinance, which we adopted in 19, uh, 1969. They're about to adopt a new one now. And we made many mistakes when we adopt that ordinance. So you're always dealing with what what is the purpose of the zoning and what does the city 
who determines what the city is going to look like in, in the years to come, because if you're building a building now, it's going to be there for 50 years. Uh, what neighborhoods are going to be residential? Which ones are going to be commercial? What kind of mix are you going to have? What about music? What about entertainment? What about manufacturing? So it's a, it's a very difficult art try to figure that out in advance and of course you're going to make mistakes when you do it you're going to do some things right too hopefully more right than wrong but having having learned that art in the city council and the, and the mayor's office uh, did you get a chance to take what you'd learned to uh, private real estate development <coughs> or to or in HUD when you were Jack uh, nobody so does anything by themselves yeah. look you the world you're as effective as the people that uh, you partner with or you, uh, you hire to help you. Uh, and uh, I've often said when I went to HUD that being a secretary for a department of that size was like steering a huge tanker out in the ocean. Mm -hmm. You can turn it, but you can only turn it so very slowly. Being mayor was like riding a a ski mobile. <laughs> I mean, it just bump, 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 something every day. Uh, you have immediate impact. Uh, if you're the mayor of a city, it's not that you are a dictator by any stretch. It just means that you're so much closer to the action and that what you do today effectively can get done within a brief period of time if you have the resources and the money and you have the votes to do it on the city council. That is not true at the federal government and the reason it's not true is that the country is so huge and so diverse uh, and there's so many elements that have to be satisfied and so many debates that have to take place that it takes a much much longer time to turn the direction of that ship. So I can't give you any any particulars that uh, any monumental changes I made in the federal government don't choose to do so. Uh, I'm willing to talk about New Orleans. Yeah, well you mentioned New Orleans. Yeah, then. I'm willing to talk about New Orleans yeah. and, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the 60s. Well let's uh, talk about one, one thing before we leave HUD. The, you mentioned the housing projects in New Orleans probably housed a larger percentage of New Orleanians than were housed in public housing owned by HUD elsewhere. Did you, did you get any insights from Washington about how to solve the problem of uh, making those housing projects work better? No, I think my job as Secretary of HUD was to try to make housing projects across the country work better. People get an impression tend to generalize. We go from, in philosophy I was taught you can't go from the particular to the general. You can't say that that uh, this situation is such, therefore all situations that look like that are such. You can go from the general and say that all uh, all males are good if that's your premise, which is not a good premise, but let's assume you say it, and so-and-so is a male, therefore he has to be good. So it's a philosophical thing. The problem with those who always are looking at a particular and then generalizing about it is that you is that you miss the boat completely because you're not seeing the general. You're just assuming that everything is like that which you see. Mm -hmm. So in cities like Chicago, uh, they had a couple of housing projects in Chicago that had to be demolished. They were just terrible projects. They were too large, built in the wrong section, uh, and uh, Mr. pruitt Igo, I think, is the, the name of one of them. That, that was the, the one in St. Louis. Was it St. Louis and pruitt Igo? It's famous for that. Uh, pruitt Igo and St. Problem Louis. Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago. Robert Taylor and, Homes and in Cabrini, Chicago. And Cabrini Green in Chicago. 
All right, so I got two of them mixed up. But then you could go into other projects that work beautifully. Uh, some that were not built in the right section of town, some that were uh, not overcrowded. And then you had an ethnic thing. Uh, if the projects here uh, were segregated, and bear in mind that you're dealing with a different animal, uh, we had segregated projects here. Then when integration came and blacks began to move into, rightly so, into what were segregated projects, whites began to leave and it was all together with the whites moving in to suburbia. Uh, you had a different, a different makeup, a different racial makeup in, in these apartments. They, many of them were integrated at first. Uh, then you ask yourself, well, maybe the city was at fault because when they were white, the city was taking better care of them not just HUD taking better care of them, but the city taking better care through uh, law enforcement and, and sanitation services and other things. So who's at fault, I don't know. But they varied throughout the country. Uh, you take the DESIRE project, for instance. The DESIRE was built long before I got into office, but you know, it was built on a dump, uh, far away from anything across the railroad tracks, uh, and it was built as a black project. I don't think it's any wonder that it turned into, ultimately, I mean, many people had a nice life there initially. It was brand new, and it was better than what they were living in, but eventually, because of its location, because of its size, uh, it deteriorated and became a pretty bad example of a, of a housing project. Uh, the St. Thomas project is a little bit different. St. Thomas was a white project which later became black and is in a pretty good section of town if you look at it today. Uh, the Kabakoff group has converted all those buildings into a mixed-use community and it's in a pretty nice section of town in terms of being close to the river, being uptown, not subject to flooding, all of those, right. all of those physical things. I'm not saying that section is perfect, but it's very close to some fairly significant real estate of value uptown. Uh, you'd have to go through every project at one, you know, yeah. and and try and analyze what was good about it, what was not bad about it. Now, what we did know is that the bundling of poor people together was not the best idea in the world. So now we're looking at mixed-use projects. Uh, and some of market renters who are paying market prices and then the others. We also had the scattered site thing in HUD, which was, well, let's forget about building projects all together. Let's take a look at building individual homes or, or of giving a rental certificate to a poor person or a person who couldn't, was below the poverty line and they could use that rental certificate to rent any piece of property that meant HUD, met HUD standards. Each one of these things has its problems. If you begin to build housing for the poor that are in really nice, expensive neighborhoods, the cost of that housing in terms of what other people are living is pretty expensive. Not more expensive than the houses next door but the majority of the people raise their eyebrows because, oh, wait a minute. I mean, I'm living in a house that's a $100,000 house, and I'm paying my notes, and my wife's working, and I'm working, and now you're building this place for this impoverished family, and it's a $300,000 house. Now, there's something out of balance with that in terms of America's ideals of you work for what you get, and you succeed by your hard work. But I've worked hard all my life, and look, I'm not getting this, and all of a sudden this person has jumped over me two, three times in terms of value. There are no easy answers to this thing. Uh, and and government, the government is wrestling with it today, and will wrestle with it in, sometime in the future. Was that something that commanded much uh, 
time in the in the uh, mayor's office at any time? And, and in your well, experience, course, or was that something that was was sort of out of the city government's well, control? Well, it depends. Education was out of the city government, and so was the housing mm -hmm. out of the city government. All right, those were federal projects. Uh, I'm not saying they didn't belong to us, but basically they're federal projects. There's a housing authority, and we have appointees for that housing authority, and we operate them. Federal government paid a in lieu of tax to the city uh, for the projects, but they were built under Fed regulations, federal diagram, federal planning. And as usual, the one size fits all doesn't entirely work from this city to another city to another city. Not casting stones of blame. You know, when you're trying new things, uh, some are going to work and some aren't. And I applaud the Federal Housing Authority for its efforts across this country. Thank God they were there and are still there. Uh, but is it something we had to deal with? Well, of course. If you take a look, if you take a look at uh, at the Desire Housing Project, that basically is where the Panther thing erupted. The, and, the confrontation uh, with between because the Because the housing project was in such disarray and uh, poverty was so great, lack of services were, uh, were there, or were not there, services were not there. So the Panthers took advantage of that and played off of that, uh, you know, that discrimination is what they, they, they attributed to. So you, you just, it, yeah, everything affects everything else. You can say it's not ours. Now, the school system was not ours either. As a matter of fact, it was against the law for us to in, interfere with the school system to the extent that you couldn't, you couldn't endorse a candidate for the school board. Uh, it was out of politics. Was that a good idea? Well, I don't think so. But that was what it was, and the school system functioned beautifully for whites, not for blacks, but beautifully for whites when I was a kid. Uh, but then integration turned all that upside down, and then the politics of it changed. I'm reading now about Chicago, and I know very little about it, so I'm just reflecting what I see in the paper in general terms, you know, taking over this school system mm -hmm. or that school system. Now the governor in Louisiana, we've gone into different modes of education. It's all public education in a sense, but operated outside of the authority of the school board, whether it's on vouchers or whether it's on some other type of method of operation, it's all public education. So the paradigm has changed and will continue to change. We keep struggling as a nation to find the best way for us to be a good, solid, productive, long-standing uh, model of democracy. Should, I really appreciate your allowing me, uh, indulging me, the, uh, the, the asking questions about the HUD and the, and, uh, the, and the Kansas Arrow concern, but I think we probably should uh, start reflecting back on the 1970s, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you, you, you were talking about the things that worked and the, and the things that didn't. Uh, well, I often look back and see and try to figure out what, uh, because you can get so enthusiastic about things. I mean, I was, I tried with the Sound and Light Show, which never got off the ground. Actually, if I could start to stop this and just... Just let's take a short, a quick just, interruption. I just need, it's just a, just Are you a, getting any outside uh, interference? Two hour yeah. It just proves, pr proves that we're in New Orleans. We're good, I'm recording. Okay, well, um, let's go back to this, this uh, vantage point of the end of the 1970s and the, and the fact that we're also in 2013. And, you know, what, what was it? What were the, the major things that you saw as having lasting positive or negative effect? 
Well, looking at it in a broad sense, Jack, and I haven't thought it through with any, any depth, but first of all, the federal government changed. In the 1970s, we were receiving money directly from the federal government in general revenue sharing, and uh, special revenue sharing for projects. Uh, we just started a whole number of federal programs under Lyndon Johnson. And then the federal government began to shift its emphasis away from the cities to the states with President Reagan. President Reagan had a philosophy of the new federalism, which was instead of the relationship between the federal government and the cities, it was emphasis on the importance of the states. That is, we're a federation of states, so shift the power from the federal government to the states. Obviously, that had a huge impact on how cities were looked upon because now the state has essentially the control, not the full control, but is a very big, serious partner of the federal government. And uh, which cities, if any, do they want to help? Or do they want to help the rural areas? Do they want to help what section? And what about the politics within the state? Democrat, Republican, Republican mayor, Democratic governor, vice versa. Uh, so that had a, a significant, uh, that change had a significant impact and is still going on today. The federalism that Reagan initiated, uh, while it might be altered a little bit, is, is pretty much still in place. The relationship between the federal and the state city government is not as close or as tight or as uh, caring as it, as it once was under previous administrations. Uh, that, that, is, that is one factor that, that certainly, certainly changed. And that affected all cities, not, right. it's not just in New Orleans. That is problem. correct. And then we adopted a new constitution, state constitution, what was it, 74, mm -hmm. 72, I, I think exactly. I think it was 72, I'm not mistaken, uh, which changed the relationship of the city to the state. Prior to 1972, uh, New Orleans sat within the Constitution almost as if it were not part of the state of Louisiana in cooperation with other cities. Other cities were under different regulations than New Orleans, or I should say New Orleans were under different regulations than other cities. Part of that goes back to the 1921 Constitution and before, where New Orleans was a very mature, big city. Uh, not much existed in Jefferson Parish, or Plaquemine Parish, or St. Tammany Parish, and, and uh, other cities that grew up after the founding of New Orleans operated under a, and were formed under different charter legislation in the state constitution than New Orleans. So New Orleans maintained its old rights and regulations under the old constitution. But 1972 came, and I can remember those constitutional convention, that constitutional convention, and I was very much insistent on getting rid of some of the limitations that we found that New Orleans had under that constitution. I had advanced 24 constitutional amendments in 1970, uh, within a, six months of my becoming mayor. Uh, that was, when you look back at it, uh, not engaging in self-praise, but to pass a constitutional amendment, one is pretty tough in the, to get on the ballot. We got 24 on the ballot. Uh, because I wanted to change the restrictions under which we functioned. Uh, one example, for instance, and I can't give you too many of them, was we were limited to a certain amount of millage. Uh, we were being very badly treated under the Homestead Exemption Relief Fund, which operated under 
the method that the state imposed the $2,000 exemption. Now it's up to $7,500, a $2,000 exemption on every homeowner from property tax. And then the state reimbursed the local government for the amount of money that cost the local government. So if you had a, a uh, $100,000 home, excuse me, a, let's say it, there weren't that many $100,000 homes back right then. If you had a $10,000 home uh, and it was assessed for 10000 which was not because everything was assessed far below the actual value, then the homeowner only paid on 8000 got an exemption in 2000 that $2,000 exemption, but let's assume your taxes as in Jefferson Parish, and I'm pulling this out of the hat, but it's pretty close, uh, was 100 mils. Then your $2,000 exemption cost Jefferson Parish $2,000, okay? Jefferson would get $2,000 back for that exemption because that's what it cost them mm -hmm. by the state imposing that exemption. Orleans Parish could only have, I think it was 43 mills altogether, 43 mills total. So for every $2,000 exemption, uh, we got back, instead of $2,000, we got back $86. So Jefferson was now being filled up with these homes. I'm not knocking Jefferson, it's just giving an example of what was happening as Jefferson single family homes got built up in home ownership rather than rental units, as many exist in New Orleans. Uh, they could raise their millage uh, and get more money. What was the reason for the limitation on millage in I don't know what the limitation was, perhaps uh, uh, who who knows? Uh, I don't know where it came from. But it was in the Constitution. It was in the Constitution, so I wanted to change that. How did you do on these? Uh, we lost all 24 of them. We lost all 24 amendments. I forget how many there were on the machine. There were 50-some amendments on the machine that year. And I think virtually every one of them lost. So Edwin Edwards, who was then governor, called a constitutional convention because it was obvious with that many constitutional amendments Something was wrong with the 1921 Constitution, outlived its usefulness. And, uh, and we paid great attention. Uh, Mary Zervagon ran as a delegate to that convention, and we monitored this thing very carefully. And she was on your staff? Yes, but she ran independently yeah. of the staff. I mean, but, but I remember her being on that convention. There were many other people. and. Of course, it was a matter of bargaining, negotiating, and arguing, but New Orleans pretty much was brought into line with the, uh, with the rest. We had brought a lawsuit to break that unfair uh, property tax redistribution system uh, and uh, the homestead exemption system, and they did. And then we won that battle, but we lost the war because the state thereafter not being obligated to put the money into the homestead exemption system uh, never has put more money in it than it did that year. So effectively they have deprived all cities of the money that they were normally doing and they keep raising the homestead exemption which is now up to uh, $7,500 on the assessment. Well, did, cities end up, did cities end up being in better posture vis-a-vis -vis the state after the con convention of, after, after the Constitution of <coughs> 1974? Well, we, it vis-a-vis -vis the state, no, I don't think we're in a better position. Uh, we have greater authority today than we did, uh, and otherwise we wouldn't have put forth all those constitutional amendments. We have much greater authority, and I can't, my memory's too short to try to go through all the details. But I think the city is in a better shape vis-a-vis -vis the state constitution. But are we in better shape vis-a-vis -vis the state? Well, not really. But part of that has to do with the changing demographics of the state. 
As I said, New Orleans used to have 85% of the population in the metropolitan area. Just think of that, 85%. Uh, now we probably have 20%, 30%. I don't know what the figure is today. But we certainly are not the dominant city that we once were vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. our neighbors. Jefferson Parish is actually larger population-wise than New Orleans is as we sit here. So when you change your posture, obviously things change in terms of your influence. We at one time, when I was in the legislature, had 20 representatives. 20 representatives. Uh, Jefferson Parish had two. I don't know what we have today, but I suspect we're sharing many with Jefferson, the St. Bernard, and the St. Tammany. We have less than Jefferson Parish. Uh, so looking or at, at this, least not any more than they do. Looking at this through the lens of what what improved and got worse in the 1970s, are you saying that, that the city government got uh, weaker because of the Constitution? and No, we got stronger. Got I'm saying we got stronger by virtue of our rights, but the practicality of, right. of us over these years having lost so much in the way of population reduced our dominance. So we're not the biggest guy on the block anymore. Uh, our position in the legislature is certainly weaker than what it was uh, back in 1970. When you had a 20 legislative voting block, that was one-fifth of the whole, state of the whole state legislature. Uh, you had pretty good sway. Uh, I'm not saying that's a terrible thing, but it's just a different posture that we we find ourselves in. By but when we began the 1970s in this conversation, New Orleans was experiencing white flight, and uh, as you know, it was wasn't just migration losing population to the suburbs; it was losing white population to suburbs. Do you think that uh, the city was able to turn that around or diminish it by the end of the decade? Well, what we, we've spent a lot of time discussing race in, in the past, and clearly what was changing in the nation was the nation was changing, particularly the South. Uh, I think New Orleans was in the vanguard of that change in the South. Uh, we were pretty early on moving forward I, because of, I think, my commitment to the issue coming out of Loyola University and the legislature and stuff. And it was something I lived with every day. Uh, so it was not dealing just with housing, not just with schools. Uh, it dealt with the social structure, economic development. How do, we, how do we function as a community rather than as two communities, one black, one white, one without any privilege and advantages, without any advantages, without the opportunities in another half which was dwindling all the time, uh, uh, basically having to carry the load because we wouldn't let the other side help carry the load and help themselves. So, yeah, we made determined efforts every day uh, to bring about a, an integrated society, uh, not only out of a sense of justice and fairness, but out of self-preservation. Mm -hmm. Uh, out of wanting the city to maintain a, a be, be vital and, and grow. So was the city a better place to live in 1980 than it had been in 1970? Well, I don't know how to answer that question, Jack. I guess every, every human were, being had to find, find where they were. Did, did you, don't, you don't change the stuff overnight. I mean, to think of the, that you're going to flick a light bulb, a switch, and the light bulb is going to go on or it's going to off. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is uh, is not realistic. Uh, depend upon whom you talk to. Life better in New Orleans today than it was in in 1940. I, I look back at it and know where I grew up, where I lived. Life certainly better for me. Uh, and I think in many ways it's better for many people. Back in 1940, we didn't have. We we lived on a street that had no. That was just a mud street. They poured uh, 
old crankshaft oil on it to keep the dust down. Uh, there was no air conditioning. There was uh, no, everybody had ice delivered to their houses. So yeah, life has gotten better in, in many ways. Let me ask it a different way. I mean, in those New Orleans, uh, more, more able to hang on to people and attract new people at the, by the well, end of the Well, obviously, and it depends upon when, you'd have to take a look back at the census tracts. Mm -hmm. We continued to lose people. Uh, I think in the 19... We were losing people, as I said, in 19... 60, we had 627,000 people. We lost people all through the 60s. I think we were losing people even in the 50s. It just happened that the census came out. We then had 627. I think we had more than that, uh, but we didn't have a census because it only come every 10 years. So I think we rose higher than that. It's not as if 1960 hit and all of a sudden, boom, we, we stopped the clock. But in 19, uh, I'm satisfied between 1950 and 1960, we had gone over 627. Somebody would have to look up those figures. They would all be estimates. But 1960, the census said it was at 627. Then 10 years later, when we started 1970, I think we're down to 500,000 when I got elected mayor. Did we continue to lose in that period? Yes, but it's not as if all of a sudden we were gaining population, lost population. The trend line was down. And uh, I think probably remained down. But what was happening within the city is that was a lot of redevelopment as a result of the federal programs. There was uh, gentrification taking place. That was whites moving back into what was an okay neighborhood that had deteriorated, either through lack of maintenance, lack of upkeep, mm -hmm. and... and, uh, and what, what neighborhoods come to mind when you mention that? Uh, Lower Garden District, well, uh, Irish Channel? Yeah, lots of places in the city. For instance, if you go to Washington, D.C., uh, where my daughter lives, which is three blocks from the Capitol, that was in the 1950s a rundown area. If you go there today, you just say, wow, look at this. Not because the houses are so big and beautiful, they are, but they're historic. The area's been maintained, and of course, many of the poor people, and not necessarily African American, were pushed out as the real estate values began to rise. You've seen this in many areas of the city uh, where real estate becomes popular. And you can see it right now for a different reason. When Katrina hit, uh, most of the city flooded. What did not flood? The rim did not flood. That's from St. Charles Avenue to the riverfront. Today, if you look at prices, I'm real estate people are telling me this today, the, they're out of sight compared to other areas of the city. Those that flooded the worst have terrible real estate markets. The values, if a house is worth $100,000 uh, before Katrina, you're lucky you could sell that same house today for $70,000. Not because they're damaged, but because of the fear of future flooding and the lust of being off of those communities. If you go up into the rim, I mean, there's shotgun doubles up there selling for $300,000 that somewhere else in the city might sell, same quality house, same thing, you know, for $100,000. So the value of the property has changed, and that's not unusual. If you go look in the warehouse district, I was talking to a real estate broker the other day and said the problem with the warehouse district now is they don't have any more inventory. All the buildings, not all, they have probably a few exceptions, but most of the uh, warehouse buildings have been converted now into apartments, so it's tough to find a new warehouse building that you can convert to apartments. 
because it's become very popular. Now, why did that happen? Well, lots of different reasons. Dome Stadium had a certain impact on it. Getting back to the riverfront had a certain impact on it. The convention said it had an impact. The World's Fair had an impact. It's difficult to put your finger on any one thing, but the trend starts and it builds, and uh, one thing builds on the next. When you, did you see, was there anybody telling us in the 1970s that um, people who lived in lower elevations were at risk from what ultimately happened during Katrina? No, I Katrina? don't recall was that. that a, Jack, when I, when I was uh, at Jesuit High School, we often went to the lakefront to play touch football. There were no levees on the lakefront. Think about that. No levees on Lake Pontchartrain. And I remember when they started building the levees. Uh, the levee, the emergency center for New Orleans, which was built not for hurricanes, but it was built for atomic warfare, which was in the filled in portion of the New Basin Canal, just as you get up to the lakefront. That bunker. And it was underground. Think about that. It was underground. There were no levees on the lakefront. Uh, so this whole idea of meeting, meeting these threats did not really exist. Uh, I'm not saying that there hadn't been floods before, but not, not until really the, I guess the, the floods, the hurricanes didn't have names at that time, but and there was one out in Justin Parish in uh, 1948, I think it was, or 47. Jefferson flooded very badly. Some parts of Orleans flooded too. So well, the, uh, we began to build levees, and the first levees they built were very small levees. I mean, all you had was the lakefront uh, seawall. Uh, not a seawall at all, it's just the steps going up, but that was considered protection enough. Now people are very aware of the fact that you got to build, and now we've got federal regulations if you want insurance. And if cities want to be able to, and parishes, want to be able to take advantage of the federal government's insurance programs, you have to follow the federal mandates on buildings. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you don't get insurance for new buildings. Now, I don't know and can't give you all the details of every nook and cranny in the state, but that's the general rule. Uh, we have a camp, for instance, over uh, out of Slidell, right on North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain that my mother and father bought. It was a very small place, but it was three feet, four feet off the ground. We have rebuilt now because Katrina wiped it out. My kids rebuilt it and they had to build it up to 17 feet, mm -hmm. which was what the parish required. And the parish required it because the federal government requires the parish to require it. Now those outside, that house is outside of a levee district because it sits right on the lake. Now uh, Maybe sometime in the future they'll raise the limit to 22 feet, I don't know. Talk, let's talk a little bit about New Orleans East in terms of, of um, flood risk. Uh, as it turned out, uh, New Orleans East was was uh, devastated by Katrina and the high storm surge. But back in 1970s, we were seeing, correct me on this if I'm wrong, we were seeing New Orleans East as an opportunity for the city of New Orleans to ex <coughs> expand, to offer suburban style, uh, mid 20th century, late 20th century uh, uh, living within the city limits? Well, it didn't start in the 70s, obviously it started a little earlier than yeah. that. Uh -huh. There were always people living out in the east. Uh, but certainly there was momentum built up from the 60s to start building subdivisions. Here we had this interstate highway system now coming out there. And uh, you had all this vacant land, which like Jefferson Parish in the 50s, had all of this vacant land. So the land was much 
less expensive than the more inner city land and the idea of the the cultural concept then was you you build subdivisions with cul-de-sacs and houses set back 20 feet with a nice lawn and etc cetera, etc cetera, single family development so New Orleans East began to build but then we had Betsy and uh, housing integration began to pick up momentum. African Americans, thank heavens, because of, because of integration, began to make money uh, so that they could afford now single-family homes. Uh, in Gentilly, I know that Lester Kabakoff, uh help with the Stearns and other people build uh, that development out there in, in Gentilly, which is Punch Train, Park. Punch Train Park, which was one of the first. It wasn't built to say, well, no whites can live here, but it was intended to be a brand new community of African Americans, and it was very nice. I mean, given its time, it was very nice. Well. Now that has moved over uh, further, further east, and uh, you're building on these lakes. The developers out there dug these big lakes, filled in the land, which was kind of marshland, with the fill from the lakes, and then built homes around the lake. So it just kept growing and growing and growing. Then Betsy came, and then Katrina came, and now the luster is off of that. Uh, in addition to that, and you cannot control human nature as much as it disappoints me, <laughs> uh, uh, it was always mixed, but over time has become more African American than white. Uh, but new generations are changing. If you watch the housing patterns now, uh, when I was young, it just wasn't done. You just did not live in, in, intentionally uh, in a same block with African Americans, with blacks or colored people. That's just the way the society was. It was terrible, but it's the way it was. Uh, Whites aren't concerned about that anymore. It's more of a class thing today. I'm not saying race is gone. It's still very much a part of us. But it is not the whole thing. Uh, and to a large extent, it has diminished significantly. And what's taken its place is class. Right. Uh, so looking at, we were talking about the things that were, uh, looking back over 40 years, the things that had worked and the things that hadn't, would you say that New Orleans East had not worked uh, the way No, I think, I think New Orleans East worked very well. I, I thought New Orleans East worked very well, but because you have a tragedy, whether that's a war or a hurricane like we have, I don't think there's any way to make that measurement. Uh, no, New Orleans East... Uh, city had to grow somewhere. We couldn't grow into Jefferson anymore. We needed to do the new land. Uh, no, I, I think New Orleans East did well. Uh, but I think it's, it's really in a down phase right now mm -hmm. because of the hurricane and all the commercial establishments got washed away. And but in, in 1980, it certainly looked as if it was a, uh, a place of promise. And, and it had already achieved some success uh, in sort of in, in expanding the city. Uh, would you say that that was one of the things that made New Orleans feel like it had turned the corner in 1980? That there was a. I don't, think, I don't think there was anything about turning a corner. I think there's always been concern about us economically shrinking, population shrinking, mm -hmm. not panic just a recognition that we were not the city we once were and never were going to be and maybe 
as my son says, going to be the city we should have been all along, not the city city we were. Uh, I don't think you can judge New Orleans by the suburban developments. Uh, we really have, government has very little control over that. You, to think that you would say, well, we don't want you moving out into that's those suburban lands and restrict people's rights to move, that's not on the charts. No, I think you have to look at things downtown. If you ask me my view of the past, I look and say, okay, what were the things that I thought were important? Clearly race was dominant, number one. The people were number one, all people. But race was clearly something that had to be uh, dealt with. And I, I think the city has dealt with that, excuse me, the city's dealt with that fairly well. Uh, compared to other cities, you got to have something to measure yourself by. Uh, I thought that the French Quarter was a valuable asset. I look at the French Quarter today and it is prospering. Not just because of the 70s, the people who started with the regulations in the 30s, and there were long fights about it, but uh, it was certainly something that I told you very early on in my earliest interviews. You have to have some idea, what are you going to do when you serve? What is it that is important, and what did I see was important in the city? I saw the French Quarter. I saw the Central Business District, Canal Street, because if we lost the engine, we could not save the city because it was de it was decreasing. Uh, and there was the riverfront and Lake Pontchartrain. Those were our core assets. Well, if I look at that, clearly the riverfront, while it is not the commercial riverfront that it was back in the 70s, it is a different riverfront and in many ways much, much, much better. Not much better from those who were longshoremen, mm -hmm. but much better from a, from a uh, transporting system with all the cruise ships coming in, with uh, the, uh, uh, the Woldenberg Park and the Moonwalk and more to come. And pub you mean public access? And public, public access, use. everything. Uh, yeah. There's no question that uh, there's been a significant enhancement. And much of it started with the, uh, with the Riverfront Expressway. I mean, I'm not, again, you don't put a switch on, it's not off and on. But clearly that was a factor that has to be looked at. Uh, the the French Quarter, uh, and to some people, not better because it's got more commercial. But I think the French Quarter is is a very alive and dynamic place today. Uh, on a very small scale, Bourbon Street, the mall I think is still there after forty years. Mm -hmm. And the mall on Royal Street, the idea of of keeping the cars accommodating the automobile, but keeping them at bay. Uh, the little little park on Bourbon Street that's for the musicians today was we got that donation from from just because as I told you I had seen Paley Park and went to public service and said why don't you give me that piece of ground and they did. Uh, How do you think the lakefront is doing? The lakefront to me has been a disappointment and again I think it's because of the hurricanes. I don't know whether I think I'm satisfied there's earth warming and great, great intensity of hurricanes, but I'm not the scientist. But, but I do think that because of the hurricanes, it, uh, it is not the lakefront that uh, I had hoped it would be. Now, one day it may get there, uh, but the levees have now been built. It's not that they're an obstruction to the lakefront, but certainly the people that lived on the lakefront can't see the lake anymore because of those levees. Uh, but there's been great damage to the lakefront because of the hurricanes. Uh, I noticed they just finished up the uh, uh, 
the Mardi Gras fountain has been restored. I remember taking my little kids out there. They loved that Mardi Gras fountain. I could always predict when it was going to change colors because I was taller than they were. <laughs> Thought that was some kind of a magic their father uh -huh. had. What about the CBD? Well, I think the CBD is doing a lot better <clears throat> because of the Poydra Street widening. Uh, what was the central core is less than it was, but the core overall, overall is much larger and, and much better uh, than it was, and so is Canal Street. Canal Street's not yet what it once was, but it clearly is coming back. And while it not come back in terms of major department stores, because that's not what major department stores do, it has remained a vitality as a commercial center in this city and with the changes that have taken place in terms of the Arborville housing project, with the, uh, with the new medical district, uh, with the regulation and the impetus of the downtown development district, the aquarium, the, you know, the Wollenberg Park, they're all tied in. It's all roughly around Canal Street. And, uh, of course, the casino at the end of it. Argue whether that's good or bad is a different question, but uh, I think Canal Street and the Downtown Development District. Now, the Downtown Development District, which always extended uh, to the bridge, uh, I think is experiencing a huge bump up uh, with the new development that's taken place off of off of Julia Street and South Rampart and O'Keefe in that area. The, the new as construction. Well as, as well, yeah, new construction as well as all of the old uh, uh, warehouses being converted into living quarters. And part of it is not just, oh, that somebody looked this forward and could see this happening. Part of it is the moving plates. What, what about the moving plates of living psychology? People today, according to a rather large article in the times Picayune last week, are looking now for smaller, places, not so much open grass to cut, bushes to take care of, uh, and places where when you step out of your, your apartment, uh, you're on the street with friendly neighbors and, and cocktail lounges and restaurants and so forth. And that's the attractiveness of living downtown uh, in a a la New York type environment rather than living in a cul-de-sac neighborhood. Now, I'm not saying that there's not some advantage to living in a cul-de-sac neighborhood. Simply saying that when you look at and talk to real estate people, uh, there is this idea of, of being able to walk to work, being able to walk to a restaurant, being out where there's action, rather than the quietness and the... Mm -hmm slow life of, so, of the so, cul-de-sac so, neighborhood. So New Orleans' present status is a walkable, livable, compact city that has uh, amenities like food, restaurants, and, and, uh, and clubs and music to go to. Didn't, can't we say that some of that uh, was, um, got underway in, in earnest in the 1970s, that it was, it was Paul Prudhomme was inventing the black and red fish, and Richard, <laughs> Richard Collin was writing about res, writing restaurant reviews for the first time in New Orleans, and the Jazz Fest was being launched by uh, various people. Including well, we the Jazz Fest the, started when so. I was there, and uh, I mean we we changed. Yes, we had an impact. I don't I don't question yeah. that. I take great pride in what we've done. As I said, some of it worked and some didn't. Uh, Changing the whole French Quarter, for instance, uh, the French market, not the French Quarter, the French market, from what it was to what it is today, they're nice, 
Uh, the, live pro the live chickens and live turkeys are gone, but we converted that building back into its original state. We built uh, the red building and a number of other things that, that worked. And the, the Jackson Square is a, is a beautiful place today. Uh, so many of those changes that we made uh, still exist today and work. As I said, not all of them. We built the river gate. Not we, Mascaro built the River Gate. Uh, it was built under his administration by the International Trade Mart. But the River Gate's gone. And it was a beautiful building. Does that mean it was a bad idea? It was a great idea when it was built. <laughs> it's just that certain things happen. Uh, in this instance, you know, we outgrew it and we built the convention center. And so the River Gate wasn't as important as it was at the time it built and then the gambling came in and there was a in quote higher and better use for that land so the river gate is gone. Uh, the Italian piazza we did, I, today I'm sad to say it hasn't worked as, as we had originally planned. It wasn't just that piece, it was pretty much the whole square. It was too ambitious. Uh, is it a loser? Not really, but far below expectations that uh, that we had for it. Uh, you know, one thing we haven't talked about directly is the Saints. I mean, they started playing in 1967, I believe. Mm -hmm. We at talked about the Superdome. At Tulane Stadium, yeah. And we talked about the Superdome, but we really haven't talked. I mean, the Saints as an institution as opposed to a, a tenant of a, of a stadium. Would you say that they had a, a positive influence through the 1970s and beyond? We went through a period as we diminished, shrunk, diminished, lost, importance of being the dominant, overpowering, huge city of the South, you begin to lose things. I mean, the Pelicans were very important here. We never had a major league team, but the Pelicans were a very important institution for us. Uh, we lost the Pelicans. Uh, we were not feeling muscular. Uh, and all of a sudden, along come the Saints. And it was a great addition to the city, and it's almost, you don't even want to think of the city without it. We would survive without it. But you don't want to think of the city without the Saints today. There's so much a part of it. They were miserable seasons, <laughs> but they were still ours. And we were in the major leagues again. Uh, One thing about the Saints, was that they seem to have been an integrated phenomenon right from the start. They were. And how, how, did that happen, or did somebody <laughs> well, Dave have Dixon, to make it Well, Dave Dixon and his group do a lot of credit, particularly Dave, because when they began to promote professional football, uh, they knew that they were facing a racial problem. Some of the black players, when they came here, had no place to stay. Uh, if you're going to have an NFL team, that's not going to work. Now, there were not that many uh, African Americans in the NFL. I'm not saying they were just a few, but there were not many. Uh, and it's the same thing with baseball. I don't mean to mix the two, but Jackie Robinson breaks it in 48. Okay, so you're not dealing with a, a very long period of time. And uh, I can remember going to the St. Games in 1967 and very first kickoff, who was the, who was the young black that uh, caught the kickoff and ran it back for a touchdown. And all of a sudden you got all the whites for the first time in our life cheering for black player. Think about that. And how was the audience? Was the, audience the audience went crazy. Was the audience, <laughs> they didn't, was race the audience, didn't matter, it was ours. Was the audience mixed? Oh, the audience was very mixed. I think there were... How did that happen? Well, when I, when I say it was very mixed, 
Yeah, there was no special section set aside. <coughs> now people somehow being people, and it's just the way we are as we're clannish, uh, but there was no racial segregation at the time. And as I said earlier in the conversation, I had gone to the governor back in 1960 to try to break down this sports barrier to no effect whatsoever. But, but it, uh, between the civil rights legislation and the changing attitudes and, and the public school integration, we're now 67. You know, we, time has passed. Time is changing. Uh, so I remember it raining, and I forget what game that was raining. And we were all, I was sitting under the stands, and was sitting with blacks and whites, and I was so fascinated by it because race was very much on my mind. Uh, so my, this is just amazing that people, people are all sitting together, and nobody's in there laughing and talking and watching the game. And it occurred to me what I experienced about how deeply, how, excuse me, how shallow some people, or the vast majority of people, felt about race. Now you have, I want to get back into the racial thing, you have your haters. I mean, that is deep, deep in their bones. Talk about the average person. Because I remember when the, the, the streetcars got integrated, and uh, as I told you as a kid, my dad taught me to play fair, my mother, and to be, be fair, be honest, be just. And I didn't think it was fair that black people had to stand up when there were seats that were available uh, on the streetcar of the bus. Well, when integration came, it, it was fascinating to see that whites who obviously would have preferred segregation, would have preferred it. No, but not haters, just, that's just the way life was. Mm -hmm. That's what they were accustomed to. Uh, would rather sit down next to a black than be discomforted and stand up. And I said, you know, that's not, that's pretty shallow. That's not, it's not a very deep feeling, if you're willing. If, if the price is to sit down or stand up, you will, well, I'll sit down rather than stand up. Okay, if the other guy's got to stand up, but not if I have to stand up. And so you saw that in the football thing too. And uh, so it's a credit to New Orleans. Listen, we've been a city that's been so mixed, so mixed racially in a thousand ways. I'm not downplaying. We were terrible with, with slavery. We we're one of the big slave trading places in America. Uh, segregated housing. But it was not the Ku Klux Klan type of thing. You know, just, that's not maybe not saying much, but it was. It was in a sense of hostility. It was a, just that's you here and I'm here. So, is it uh, is it correct to say that the Saints made it a little easier to integrate New Orleans? Well, it's absolutely correct. It, they they certainly did. Uh, they had a. Uh, a serious change took place because we now have black players and we're cheering them. Didn't happen before. No blacks played with the Pelicans. I mean, the play, there were black Pelicans. They had a team they played, but whites played here, they played there. If you went to the games, you sat in the white section, blacks sat in the black sections. It was that way with the movies. I mean, listen, nobody can explain this thing. This the segregation and all of that is beyond any rational explanation. It just, nobody can capture this thing. Thousands and thousands of books have been written about it, and everybody's got their own view and their own opinion. I don't know whether it's Klan's been, I don't mean Ku Klux Klan, but Klanism, uh, whether it's tribalism, whether it's built into us, uh, whether it's family, I don't know. It's, it's just a strange thing that color had become the factor. Now, other people have suffered discrimination nowhere near in this country what the African Americans did. Obviously, the Indians have, but the early immigrants of Italians and Irish and yeah. others have gone through terrible periods, but not anything like slavery or, or, or 
of legal segregation. So um, um, Saints had a had an unquestioned. Was, me, were were there other right. other phenomena of the nineteen seventies that had the same kind of effect? I mean the the, the music. Well, we've discussed the the push to involve lunch groups, young men's business club. Mm -hmm. uh, Plimsoll Club, uh, mm -hmm. right. organizations, the uh, Mardi Gras organizations. Uh, uh, I'm uh, thinking also about just pl the the music. I mean, the, the most of the music in New Orleans that was rediscovered in the 1970s was uh, was African American in origin, and the audiences were large. The audiences that were doing the the discovering were white, if you, which you could see at the. The Jazz well, Fest, you could also see it at clubs. Was that long before that, though, Jack? Uh, whites uh, in, enjoyed black performers. It's that doesn't have anything to do with equality. Mm -hmm. uh, that has to do with people liking what somebody can do and watching them. That doesn't have to do with eating mm -hmm. with them or sitting down with them. It's a I think that's a different thing entirely. Uh, I was trying to get you to equate. No, the Saints Amos and Andy. Andy. For instance, we used to listen to the Amos and Andy uh, things on television, which people argue was racist, not racist, you know. But it was a black program, and it was a funny program. I mean, I, I, I make no secret about loving to listen to Amos and Andy as a young kid. Uh, uh, you know, my brother. We often, I often call him Andy. You know, out of off of that show because we we enjoyed it so much. Uh, so it's uh, obviously you didn't have any serious black movie stars at that time, but you had, you know, Harry Belafonte who's done some things and uh, a couple of other actors that had performed, and I forget the male, female singer that people enjoyed. Uh, but now you've got major black actors, major black directors, and segregation is long gone. I'm saying racism is still here. I was trying to... I, look, all you got to do is look at, <laughs> look at Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama in, in the last presidential election and look at the votes. Now, I don't like to go from the particular to the general. It's a terrible mistake. But you just look at, try to give me some other explanation for it. Uh, well, what I was trying I run into to, people know, who just hate Obama. What, what do you hate about him? I, 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 di I didn't necessarily like this guy or that guy. I disagreed with him and wouldn't have voted for him. There's no, they just hate him. I mean, it's... it's and they don't think it's race, but maybe it isn't. I don't know. As you could tell, I was trying to get you to equate the crowd at a jazz fest concert, 100,000 people, with a, a crowd at, uh, at a Saints game. And, uh, but it doesn't seem like you're, you're buying that idea. No, I'd, I can do that. I'm not... Uh, in the Saints game, the, the, people, the people are sitting together but and because of the rain they were all, they were reacting but when you go to the jazz fest and I haven't been there in a while myself uh, or to the fest on the riverfront there is a there is a togetherness and as you watch Mardi Gras parades black standing next to whites both of them grabbing a set of beads, but yielding one to the other. There is an arm, warmth and a friendliness that exists in this city that doesn't exist anywhere else in the United States, as far as I could find. Uh, and that has nothing to do with class. People going to the jazz fest, class is out of the window. People going to the festivals on the riverfront, class is out of the window. There, people are looking and they're enjoying the music, and they're all in to the same thing at the same time. That doesn't mean at nighttime they haven't now gone back to their various homes in their various neighborhoods. Uh, and 
this idea of tribalism and clanism, and when I say tribal, I'm not referring to black, I'm talking about the concept of tribalism of people uh, living within a closed environment of large family and nobody else can get in. This is our territory out in the wilderness. Uh, I keep reading about tribalism in, in some of the eastern countries that right now in Afghanistan that rule their areas. That's their area. Uh, or clanism. Call it a clan. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what it is. There's something about people that causes us to always kind of associate with whether it's your classmates in high school or if you're from Jesuit, we go to some place and there are a bunch of Jesuit guys here and a bunch of Aloysius guys there. That Jesuit guys get together, the Aloysius guys get together. Something in common. And perhaps the idea of clan uh, is, is the ancestry, I don't know, this is ours. You find it with Italians and and with Germans and with Mexicans. We all have a sense of identity. I'm, I'm thinking... Um, Way over my head in this sociology, but that's <laughs> just well, what I'm, re I'm remembering a, an, inc an incident from the early 1970s when you had to remember some, had to remind some New Orleanians not to be quite so clanic, clannish or exclusionary. Had well, mind let me ask you, you, you were, this was back when your friend Pascal Caligero was running for uh, the Supreme Court. Yes. And, and uh, you had to write a letter to his opponent that was published in the newspaper. Well, I didn't write a letter to him, I just published a <laughs> You published a message newspaper. in the newspaper. Message in the newspaper. So that Mr. Serpy will understand. Mr. Serpy had been, had been <coughs> Rex. I think at the beginning of 1972, and the election was at the end of 1972. And uh, I think it's, is it fair to say that you thought that, that um, Mr. Sarpy was, was being uh, clannish in not understanding that uh, you could support a Pascal Caligero uh, for reasons other than business advantage or, pers or that you could do it for friendship? Yes, I think I did. Uh, there clearly was, in the Sarpy campaign, and I t do not mean to demean Mr. Sarpy. He was a good man and a fine man and is a, one of my teachers at Loyola University, uh, adjunct professor, and a very prominent lawyer. But he was of very high social standing, and I clearly whether correctly or incorrectly, got the impression from his television ads that uh, he felt that he was uh, entitled to this job over uh, my friend Caligero, who has come from a poor Italian family, uh, just by virtue of his status in life. And so I wrote that a uh, piece that appeared in the paper after listening to one of his television programs when he was in his garden of his very beautiful home clipping roses and talking about, uh, about me supporting Pascal Caligero who was not really qualified to be mayor. Now Caligero had finished first in his class, a brilliant guy and won every award in the law school. And uh, so I wrote a very strong response to that, to that uh, commercial that he had put on for his election. And you wrote it, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you wrote it towards the end of the Supreme Court election. Sitting, second, sitting where second, you're, second primary. Sitting where you're sitting, sitting right, sitting right here with the yellow pad. You like wrote it on a yellow pad. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was furious at it. I really was. It was uh, unnecessary for him and uh, uh, to say that. But you know, things get out of hands in campaigns. I'm not. I, I hold no grudge. Well, no. do you think that kind of um, uh, clannishness or exclusionary uh, behavior in New Orleans had, had diminished? Uh, over the oh, I think I think so. I, I think as 
while there's still a significant income gap, I think the social thing in New Orleans, while it still exists, and there is segregation in the, uh, if not absolute, there is segregation in the country clubs and in many Mardi Gras clubs. Uh, I'm not saying that that today they should be doing things differently. I think so, but we're well past this whole question of of uh, public accommodations and so mm -hmm. forth. People have a right to have their group if they want to, if they want a group, yeah. and it's family. It's just like family weddings. Uh, somebody gets married, do they have to invite African Americans? Or do African Americans get married? Do they have to invite whites whom they don't know? Mm -hmm. Or do you invite your family and your close friends? Uh, so I think those are tough judgments to make, and uh, people have a right to live their life the way they want to. I would prefer a more integrated society. But as I said, I think the race thing has given, given way to class now. Uh, I mean, I, you, you, you dwell on these... Again, going particularly to the general is not fair, but I can tell you that uh, the example I had with Steve with Perkins when he was the architect, that a black architect I gave the contract to, yeah. all of a sudden he became a great, brilliant architect Skip and Perkins. controlled the contract. Uh -huh. uh, prior to that time, the whites couldn't deal with him because he was not a competent architect. So you have... You have blacks today that have moved up in the economic system. Let me just say they're far more acceptable to white businessmen who can make a profit with them than they were before mm -hmm. when they couldn't. So we're all selfish. Uh, we're all self-oriented and that's uh, and you find it among the blacks. This is not an exclusive while you want to blame the blame for the whole thing. Or, yeah, go back to slavery and Jim Crow and that's a fact. But as human beings, separate and apart from that, you find it. Uh, I mean, it's the slave traders, and in, in many of the slave traders were black. I mean, uh, and so it doesn't, doesn't have to be just a color thing. It's a right. well, selfishness uh, of human nature. I'm thinking of a non-color thing. Uh, back, back in the, I recollect, in the 1970s, uh, coming out of Tulane and University of New Orleans uh, were some professors who were saying, Charles Chai and James Bobo were saying New Orleans was inhibiting its ability to grow economically because it didn't allow these new outside businessmen to join the clubs or to participate in social activities. And so we were, <coughs> did that actually happen that we were discriminating against, say, Texans who were coming here to set up oil company? Uh, offices? Yes. Yes, it did. And I can't give you specific examples, but we received complaints about it. But you'd have to ask yourself why. If you have an organization that has a blackball system, I've never been part of one of these organizations, I know I only know what I've been told, that have a blackball system that any one person can say no, because you've built this organization on this structure of we run this organization and we don't want somebody who is contrary to a member who said, I can't live with this person, you know, in this organization. We will abide by that number's wish. So you get a black ball. Okay. Well, there's some automatic black balls. And that was if you're black, you got an automatic black ball. Uh, what about somebody who's not black? What about somebody who's Italian? And people have this anti-Italian view. Or you're Jewish. There's no question that the, the discrimination against Jews can't be denied. Discrimination against Italians can't be denied. I mean, it's, it was that. Joe DeRosa, he used to tell the story, and Joe and I were never close friends, but he was an auditor. He said that they're doing some auditing work, but he could only go in the back door of the Boston Club. <laughs> he was Italian. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's strange. Uh, 
I spoke to a very important person in, in the city and is a member of the Boston Club, and I said, why? Why can't you admit this Jewish member to this club? Uh, and uh, the guy just paled. He said, and, and it was a very good friend of his, because I wanted to try to do it with the Jewish community. And uh, I said, you have said this is the best. I've heard you say this is the the greatest person you had ever met, and yet you can't take him to the club because it's as a no entrance, and the fellow was Jewish. And he just said, Moon, please, don't, it's just, don't, please, let it alone, you know. Uh, and I went to the Jewish community, not the community, about five or six very prominent Jewish people in the city. And I said to them, uh, not in groups, but individually, look, I think we can get this thing done if you all stick with it. And not one of them accepted. So we don't need that. So it's a, a discrimination. The, the problem with it is that when you went about the racial discrimination thing, you would run into Italian who'd say, oh, Moon, don't tell me about discrimination. I know I've been discriminated against, as if they're discrimination. The little slights that have experienced, not little, the slights they've experienced in their life amounted to what the black community was going through in terms of judicial, legalistic, racial segregation were the same. Well, it's not the same. There is this thing of people belonging to clubs and uh, the school clubs, school fraternities, this, that, and the other. There's big arguments now about integration of fraternities. I thought fraternities were integrated a long time ago on an LSU's campus and other campuses. Some aren't, some are, and some aren't, apparently. Uh, you now, the big argument gets to be about gays and permitted it to the Boy Scouts, the boys. You know, we make these judgments that uh, I guess people in a free society have a right to make. Uh, not pleasant and not smart and not pretty, but they are pretty free to make them mm -hmm. uh, under certain circumstances. Do you think New Orleans was able to ease up on some of those uh, prejudices and, dis and exclusions in time to embrace the people who wanted to come here and do business and live and enjoy the black and red fish? Well, you, again, I'm not suggesting to you that people were always objecting to somebody, and I know of a few, very few examples, because of race or ethnicity, simply didn't like somebody. Uh, and this was their club. Let me give you an example without any mention any name. Let's let's assume you have a very high social Mardi Gras club. This has been a club that's grown up with grandfather, son, grandson, aunts, uncles. Uh, yes, they have had an occasional entrance on the outside through a son-in-law or maybe even through someone who's not by blood related. And they belong to this club. Now, a businessman comes from Houston, New York, someplace, wants to join that club. And they say no. Is that discrimination? I mean, they, they've said no to 50 other people who wanted, who wanted to join the club for various reasons. Because these was a very prominent, upscale group, could, couldn't do anything but help you if you got to be a member of it. So it's not just... Uh, Does that hurt New Orleans? Well, in, in, well, that kind of social structure certainly did. Does that help? When you have them? that kind of 
it, it just, it, it exists every place. But New Orleans had more of it because of Mardi Gras. Now, I don't believe there's a country club in the world. That's probably a terrible statement to make. But in the United States, and that's a terrible statement to make too. But they just let the first woman in to the masters, right? I mean, think about that. The first first woman uh, uh, into the <laughs> into the masters country club, first membership. Uh, so we had this thing with excluding women. Uh, I'm just trying to say to you, it's not all race. Race was by far the worst, by far the most prevalent. But when you look at the female thing, and you, and, and, uh, you look at the immigrate, immigrants who came here who were excluded, some because of their ethnicity, some because of religion, as in the case of the Jewish uh, discrimination, it, it exists. I'm not excusing it. I'm just trying to understand it. And you can't cure, you can't get anything to work absolutely perfectly. Now, New Orleans in, is a contradiction because I don't know of another city, and I really can tell you that I'm way out of the loop now, but I've been into the vast majority of the major cities in New Orleans in the United States. No other city does what this city does in terms of its celebrations. It's not, it is unique. And that's why people come here. The festivals are unique. The, not just the quality of the music, it's the, it's the mixture of people. The, the total mixing of, of race, of, uh, on that plane, I'm not talking about between the sheets or in the in the dining rooms, I'm simply saying at that plane. Where else can you find it? I'd, I'd I'd like to see New York or Chicago or Los Angeles have a parade here where whites are parading through black neighborhoods, black through white neighborhoods, and people are sharing the same thing and grabbing for the same beads, and at night they go home to their particular houses in their particular neighborhoods. Uh, it, it's for some reason there's a timeout. Somebody, somebody calls a timeout, and race doesn't matter, ethnicity doesn't matter. I've you go to the you go to the jazz fest. You could be sitting or parade. You could be standing next to somebody worth fifty million dollars, and you were not worth ten cents, and it wouldn't make much difference. One of the to give you a personal example. Otto Candies is one of my great memories and great friends and a multi multi millionaire who worked himself up from the from the bayou. He was a shipbuilder. Used, used to come used to come to Gallia Hall with me because we were good friends and I'd invite his family and his thing was to stand on the street and scurry for beads under the under the mast stand. <laughs> and I'd say, Look, you got a wonderful seat for you. That's what he wanted to do. And so many people do that. They have become not who they are. They understand? They're not who they are on that day. I've seen, I've seen queens that I knew were queens at Mardi Gras balls down on Bourbon Street with their, now not on that night, but <laughs> later on, Another night, just with the rival. It's it's uh, that's their night was to be queen. Now they're back to being anonymous. It's a strange structure. It's a magnificent city. It it defies definition. Uh, it will go on. And uh, the river's here. The lake is here. Uh, I think the engine is pretty secure. That is Canal Street and CBD and all kind of developments will take place and we'll have future storms and we might even have wars. God, I hope not. But uh, it's a very unique place and each generation builds or alters a little bit on what the previous generation did. 
So it uh, it'll keep working. Well, Mr. Mayor, that is is a great um, summary of uh, where we've uh, you know where we are now, looking back uh, forty years, but also looking ahead. And uh, I really appreciate once again your time today. I I. Uh, I hope we can come back. And well, when you all review this, if there are other things you think we can cover, if we've made any mistakes, call me and we'll try to correct them. Well, we'll probably um, be talking to more people and, and be prompted to ask some, some different questions, and we hope that you'll have time to, to see us again. I haven't asked Justin, uh, and I haven't even introduced him or myself, but Justin Nystrom, a uh, history, history professor at Loyola, who is uh, standing behind the cameras. It, Justin, any questions you'd like to ask at this point? Um, I'm, I'm going to be selfish at yes. this point. Um, on Tuesday night, a week from tonight, we're doing an event at Loyola. And I've been interviewing people who uh, have been going to Dookie Chase Restaurant for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd kind of like to know when the first time was you went there. probably in the 70s. I was not, I say probably in the 70s. I don't, I could have gone when I was a councilman. I do not recall going to Dookie Chase's for any racial purposes. I don't mean I attended as far as I can recall and don't recall any clandestine meetings we had at Dookie Chase's to do this. If I went, I knew Leah Chase. It was a great restaurant. And uh, I went there just with a couple of friends to have a meal. But not with any groundbreaking thing in mind. Uh, I remember I remember when public accommodations passed the federal law, I called a black friend of mine and said, let's go to lunch. So I'd never been to lunch with him before and uh, took him to a white establishment to have lunch just to feel good about it. <laughs> the law had passed and this was now all okay, you know. Where, where did you go? What's the hotel behind the behind the St. Louis Cathedral? There's a hotel there. The St. Louis Hotel. And yeah, and I don't know if it's St. Louis. It's where the Quadroon Ballroom was. I know. I know what you mean. That's where we went. Yeah. Now, don't ask me why I did that. I could have gone anywhere, but the thought of going going there somehow fascinated me. I'd never been there before. So. Uh, so I, as soon as that law passed, I wanted to do that. It just uh, something, something motivated me to do it. Kind of a joyful celebration. Uh, as I said, when Norman Francis was in school, and I've told you the story on the tapes, and uh, it was 1952 he entered, and 1954 Brown versus Board of Education passed big headlines in the paper. And I saw him in the, bumped into him in the foyer of the school, which was then at a big house on St. Charles Avenue. And I said, thank God it's over, you know, thinking that because Supreme Court had ruled, the world had just changed automatically. Well, it did change, but it's still wrestling with a lot of the problems and the courts wrestling with, with admissions today. But I was just a young guy studying to be a lawyer and foolish enough thinking, well, the Supreme Court spoke, that's it, it's over with. Well, it was not just beginning, really. So was, uh, you make those judgments. And that's why I've been so, uh, so insistent on talking about nothing happened immediately and ended immediately during my term of office. You, you're playing off of things that happened before and people are playing off of things that happened with you, either changing them, discarding them, or using them to build to build on. Uh, and that's been happening in this city since we were founded. 
You got anything else? Well, we'll have it later. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Pretty. I'll be happy to 